from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Earnings season has shown a conflicting mix of signals for software companies. While virtually all firms are expressing caution over so-called macro headwinds, we're talking about Ukraine, inflation, interest rates, Europe, uh, FX headwinds, supply chain, just overall IT spend. MongoDB, along with a few other names, appeared more sanguine thanks to a beat in the recent quarter and a cautious but upbeat outlook for the near term. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis ahead of MongoDB World 2022, we drill into Mongo's business and what ETR survey data tells us in the context of overall demand and the patterns that we're seeing from other software companies. And we're seeing some distinctly different results from major firms these days. We'll talk more about Mongo in this session, which beat EPS by 30 cents and revenue by more than $18 million. Salesforce had a great quarter and its diversified portfolio is paying off as seen by the stock's noticeable uptick post earnings. UiPath, which had been really beaten down prior to this quarter, has brought in a new co-CEO, and its business is showing a nice rebound with a small three-cent EPS beat and a nearly $20 million top-line beat. CrowdStrike is showing strength as well. Meanwhile, managements at Microsoft Workday and Snowflake expressed greater caution about the macroeconomic climate, and especially on investors' minds is concern about consumption pricing models. Snowflake in particular, which had a small top line beat, cited softness and effects from reduced consumption, especially from certain consumer facing customers, which has analysts digging more deeply into the predictability of their models. In fact, Barclays analyst, Ramo Lenshaw published an especially thoughtful piece on this topic, con concluding that Mongo was less susceptible to consumption headwinds than, for example, Snowflake. Essentially for a few reasons. One, because Atlas, Mongo's cloud-managed service, which is the consumption model, comprises only about 60% of Mongo's revenue. Second is a premise that Mongo is supporting core operational applications that can't be easily dialed down or turned off. And three, that Snowflake customers it sounds like has a more concentrated customer base and due to that fact, there's a preponderance of its revenue is consumption driven and would be more sensitive to swings in these consumption patterns. Now I'll say this first, consumption pricing models are here to stay and the much preferred model for customers is consumption. The appeal of consumption is I can actually dial down, turn off if I need to and stop spending for a while, which happened or at least happened to a certain extent uh, this quarter for certain companies. But to the point about Mongo supporting core applications, I do believe that over time, you're going to see the increased emergence of data products that will become core monetization drivers. And Snowflake, along with other data platforms, is going to feed those data products and services and become over time maybe less susceptible and less sensitive to these consumption patterns, it'll always be there, but I think increasingly it's going to be tied to operational revenue. Last two points here in this slide. Software valuations have reverted to their historical mean, which is a good thing in our view. We've taken some air out of the bubble and a return to more normalized valuations was really predicted and looked forward to. Well, look, we're still in a lousy market for stocks. It's really a bear market for tech. The market tends to be at least six months ahead of the economy. And often, not always, but often is a good predictor. We've had some tough compares relative to the pandemic days in tech. And we'll be watching next quarter very closely because the macro headwinds have now been firmly inserted into the guidance of software companies. Okay, let's have a look at how certain names have performed relative to a software index benchmark so far this year. Here's a year-to-date chart comparing Microsoft, Salesforce, Mongo, and Snowflake to the IGV Software Heavy ETF, which is shown in the darker blue line, which by the way, it does not own, this ETF does not own Snowflake or Mongo. 
You can see that these big super caps have fared pretty well, whereas Mongo and especially Snowflake, those higher growth companies, have been much more negatively impacted year to date from a stock price standpoint. Now, let's move on. Let's take a financial snapshot of Mongo and put it next to Snowflake so we can compare these two higher growth names. What we've done here in this chart is taken the most recent quarter's revenue and multiplied it by 4x to get a revenue run rate. And we parenthetically added a projection for the full year revenue. Mongo, as you see, will do north of a billion dollars in revenue, while Snowflake will begin to approach $3 billion, 2.7, and run right through that, that four-quarter run rate that they just had last quarter. And you can see Snowflake is growing faster than Mongo at 85% this past quarter. And we took now these most of these profit these next profitability ratios off the current quarter, with one exception. Both companies have high gross margins. Of course, you'd expect that. But as we've discussed, not as high as some traditional software companies, in part because of their cloud costs, but also, you know, their maturity or lack thereof. Both Mongo and Snowflake, because they are in high growth mode, have thin operating margins. They spend nearly half or more than half of their revenue on growth. That's the SG&A line, mostly the S, the sales and marketing is really where they're spending money. Uh, and, and they're specialists, so they spend a fair amount of their revenue on R&D, but maybe not as high as you might think, but a pretty hefty percentage. The free cash flow as a percentage of revenue line, we calculated off the full year projections because there was a kind of an anomaly this quarter in the, in the Snowflake numbers. And you can see Snowflake's free cash flow uh, which again was abnormally high this quarter is going to settle in around 16% this year versus Mongo's 6%. So strong focus by Snowflake on free cash flow and its management. Snowflake has about $4 billion in cash and marketable securities on its balance sheet with little or no debt. Whereas Mongo has about $2 billion on its balance sheet with a little bit of longer term debt. And you can see Snowflake's market cap is about double that of Mongo's. So you're paying for higher growth with Snowflake. You're paying for the Slootman Scar Scarpelli execution engine, the expectation there, a stronger balance sheet, et cetera. But Snowflake is well off its roughly $100 billion valuation, which it touched during the peak days of tech during the pandemic. And just that as an aside, Mongo has around 33,000 customers, about five times the number of customers Snowflake has. So a bit of a different customer mix and concentration, uh, but both companies, in our view, have no lack of market in terms of TAM. Okay, now let's dig a little deeper into Mongo's business and bring in some ETR data. This colorful chart shows the breakdown of Mongo's net score. Net score is ETR's proprietary methodology that measures the percent of customers in the ETR survey that are adding the platform new, that's the lime green at 9%. Existing customers that are spending 6% or more on the platform, that's the forest green at 37%. Spending flat, that's the gray at 46%. Decreasing spend, that's the pinkish at around 5%. And churning, that's only 3%. That's the bright red for Mongo. Subtract the red, from the greens and you net out to a 38%, which is a very solid net score figure. Note, this is a survey of 1,500 or so organizations and it includes 150 Mongo DB customers, which includes, by the way, 68 Global 2000 customers. And they show a spending velocity or net score of 44%, so notably higher among the larger clients. And while it's a smaller sample, only 27, EMEA's net score for Mongo is 33%. Now that's down from 60% last quarter. Note that Mongo cited softness in its European business on its earning call. So that aligns to the ETR data. Okay, now let's plot Mongo relative to some other data platforms. These don't all necessarily compete head to head with Mongo, but they are in data and database platforms um, in the ETR data set. And that's what this chart shows. It's an XY graph with net score, or as we say, spending momentum on the vertical axis and overlap or presence or pervasiveness in the data set on the horizontal axis. See that red dotted line there at 40%? That indicates an elevated level of spending. Anything above that is highly elevated. We've highlighted Mongo in that red box, which is very close to that 40% line 
It has a pretty strong presence on the x-axis right there with GCP. Snowflake, as we've reported, has come down to earth, but still well elevated. Again, that aligns with the earnings releases. Uh, AWS and Microsoft, they have many data platforms, especially AWS. So their plot position reflects their broad portfolio, massive size on the x-axis. Um, that's the presence and, and very impressive on the vertical axis. So despite that size, they have strong spending momentum. And you can see the pack of others, including Cockroach, small uh, on the vertical, on the horizontal, but elevated on the vertical. Couchbase is creeping up since its IPO. Redis, MariaDB, which was launched the day that Oracle bought Sun and, and, and got MySQL. Um, and some legacy platforms, including the leader in database, Oracle, uh, as well as IBM and Teradata, both cloud and on-prem platforms. Now, one interesting side note here is on Mongo's earning call, it clearly cited the advantages of its increasingly all-in-one approach relative to others that offer a portfolio of bespoke, or what we some, sometimes call horses for courses, databases. Mongo cited the advantages of its simplicity and lower costs as it adds more and more functionality. This is an argument often made by Oracle, and they often target AWS as the company with too many databases. And of course, Mongo makes that argument uh, as well, but they also make the argument uh, that Oracle, they don't necessarily call them out, but they talk about traditional relational databases. Of course, they're talking about Oracle and others. They say that's more complex, less flexible, and less appealing to developers than is Mongo. Now, Oracle, of course, would retort, we retort saying, hey, we now support a MongoDB API, so why go anywhere else? We're the most robust and the best for mission critical. But this gives credence to the fact that if Oracle is trying to capture business by offering a Mongo API, for example, that Mongo must be doing something right. Okay, let's look at why they buy Mongo. Here's an ETR chart that addresses that question. It's it's uh, Mongo's feature breadth is the number one reason lower cost or better ROI is number two, integrations and stack alignment is third, and Mongo's technology lead is fourth. Those four kind of stand out. With notice on, on the right hand side, security and vision much lower there on the right. That doesn't necessarily mean that Mongo doesn't have good security and, and, and good vision, although it has been cited uh, security concerns. Um, and, and so we, we keep an eye on that. But look, Mongo has a document database. It's become a viable alternative to traditional relational databases, meaning you have much more flexibility over your schema. Um, and in fact, you know, it's kind of schema-less. You can pretty much put anything into a document database. Uh, developers seem to love it. Generally, it's fair to say Mongo's architecture would favor consistency over availability because it uses a single master architecture as a primary and you can create secondary nodes in the event of a primary failure. But you got to think about that and how to architect availability into the platform and got to consider recovery more carefully. Now, now, no schema means it's not a tables and rows structure. And you can, again, shove anything you want into the database but you got to think about how to optimize performance um, on queries. Now, Mongo has been hard at work evolving the platform from the early days. When you go back and look at its roadmap, it's been, you know, started as a, a document database purely. It added graph processing, time series. It's made search, you know, much, much easier and more fundamental. It's added Atlas, that fully managed cloud database uh, service, which we said now comprises 60% of its revenue. It's you know Kubernetes integrations and it's kind of the modern you know, microservices stack and dozens and dozens and dozens of other features. Mongo's done a really fine job, we think, of creating a leading database platform today that is loved by customers, loved by developers, and is highly functional. And next week, the Cube will be at MongoDB World, and we'll be looking for some of these items that we're showing here in this this chart. This. Always going to be main focus on developers. Mongo prides itself on being a developer-friendly platform. We're going to look for new features, especially around security and governance and simplification of configurations and cluster management. Mongo is likely going to continue to advance its all-in-one appeal and add more capabilities that reduce the need to 
to spin up bespoke platforms. And we would expect enhancements to Atlas, further enhancements there. Is Atlas really is the future, you know, maybe adding you know, more cloud native features and integrations and perhaps simplified ways to migrate to the cloud, to Atlas and improve access to data sources, generally making the lives of developers and data analysts easier. That's gonna be, we think, a big theme at the event. So these are the main things that we'll be scoping out at the event. So please stop by if you're in New York City, New York City at MongoDB World or tune in to thecube.net. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks to my colleagues, Stephanie Chan, who helps research breaking analysis from time to time. Alex Meyerson is on production as today is, as is Andrew Frick, Sarah Kenny, Steve Conti, Conti, Anderson Hill, and the entire team in Palo Alto. Thank you. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight helped get the word out. And Rob Hof is our editor-in-chief over there at Silicon Angle. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. We do publish each week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. Want to reach me? Email me, david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante or comment on my LinkedIn post. And please do check out etr.ai for the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching. See you next time.